<clears throat> if you've got a Bible, could you turn in, in the book of Mark, chapter 10? We're going to read from verse 17. So God's been speaking to me about the story of the rich young ruler over the last couple of weeks. I, I stumbled across it in my kind of regular devotions, and I, I got stuck. I got stuck on this question that, that perhaps the most important question that one can ask, how this young man come, comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And I remember, I remember walking into Every Nation Church, his people in uh, Umgeni Road, they've got a, a building there, and they were, it was about two years ago, and they were going through a sermon series, and big and bold on the front of the church, it said, eternity matters. That's all. The whole church was painted blue in the front, and it says, eternity matters. And I was struck by that, because in the busyness of every day, and in the frantic rush and doing things, we forget. We forget that we are part of a bigger story. We forget to, to ans ask and answer the biggest questions of life. And perhaps this question, like the, the, the rich young ruler that he asked, is the most important question that we could ever ask. Good teacher, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And so that's what this morning is all about. I'm going to read the story as Mark reads it. You're welcome to read also in the book of Luke and the book of Matthew. They tell it slightly different, but it's the same basic story. And then what I want to do is I want to dig into the question. I want to unpack what was this guy asking? What was he really asking? Because I think we've, we, we, we might have some different ideas about that. And then we're going to go through Jesus' answer to the man. And then the, the bulk of the teaching actually in, in the story is how Jesus then speaks to the crowds afterwards and he unpacks what, is, what has just happened to help them understand. And that's going to be some of the take-home points. Marikhan, just to check, have you got the slides? No slides. Okay, no stress. Cool. So let's read Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 31. I'm reading from the ESV translation, if you have that. And it said, as he was setting out on his journey... The young man, uh, as Jesus was setting out, a man ran up and he knelt before Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, don't murder, don't steal, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, and I love this, looking at him, he loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around. This is the teaching to the crowd now. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God says they were exceedingly astonished. They were exceedingly astonished, and they said to Jesus, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but with not with God, for all things are possible with God. Then Peter began to say to Jesus, said, see, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are the first will be last and the last will be first. What an amazing story. Let's just, let's just pray before we keep going. Father God, I just pray that you open up your word now to us. I pray that you speak to us, that you reveal whatever you want to reveal. Thank you that you are here with us, Lord. We just sense your presence. 
We're aware that you are speaking. We're aware that you are talking to us. Even just as we sang in worship, Father, we open our hearts now to you and say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. We receive whatever you want to say to us now. Whatever that is. Amen. Cool. So what I want to do is I want to dig deeper into the question. And the question, good teacher, what must I do to, have, to inherit eternal life? And if you look literally at the Greek, it says, what action should I carry out? What action should I carry out to inherit or to obtain the life of the ages to come? The Greek word is zoe ionos, the life of the age to come. And the first kind of sub-question is, what was this guy thinking of when he was talking of zoe ionos? When he was talking of eternal life, what was a young, rich, Jewish, religious guy's perspective? What was his framework? Today, um, today when we think about heaven, many people will think um, that heaven is a place we go to without our bodies, where we're going to be with God and play, play Christmas carols with the harps on the clouds or something like that. But that's, that originates mostly from Greek thought. The Greeks thought back then already that somehow this world that we have is pretty bad and that God will one day liberate our souls from our bodies and take our souls away to a better place that is far away from the, from the evil world we are at. That was Greek world. Then Greek thinking said what is physical and, and of this earth is bad. What is spiritual is good. So you separate your spirituality from the physical world. But it's interesting that when we look at the passage, we see things like treasure in heaven. See Jesus talking about entering into the kingdom of God, thinking of uh, who can be saved. He talks about now in this time and the time to come. And it's clear that there's a different, a different worldview happening here. See, Jewish thought, if you go back to the first chapter of the Bible, what was the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden was heaven on earth. It was God, the God of the heavens, staying with the children of creation. It was heaven on earth. The spiritual was not distinct from the physical. Eden was heaven on earth. And heaven on earth was some kind of emerged reality. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? Yes, um, God banished them from the garden. And so in some way, the place where God was and the place where people were got separated. There was also a relational separation. Of course, we've upset God and we've angered Him. But there's a, a, there's a metaphorical separation between this place where God is and the place where people, are, where, where people are. What happens in the last chapters of the Bible? Revelations 21. New Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth. What's happening is that God wants to reunite the, 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 the dwelling place of God with the dwelling place of man. And so in Jewish thought... In Jewish thought, this thing of a, a paradise that is very separate to this earth we live in is not there. Life of the ages to come has got to do with something about something here. The second kind of sub-question is, what was a Jewish guy in the time of Jesus thinking about when it comes to death and when it comes to resurrection? Was he asking about the good life now or about the good life after I die? Again, today, many of us um, have, a, have a theology and have a worldview where we say, listen, things are bad, but we must just hold on until one day Jesus comes and rescues us. Was he thinking about the good life now on earth as it is in heaven? Or was he thinking about the good life after I die when I go to a better place? And it's interesting when you do some research on this. I read up a bit, a bit about it in the week. Resurrection was not a big thing in the early Judaism up until about 400 before Jesus, resurrection wasn't a big thing. The, the big thing and the focus of Jewish spirituality was living under the blessing of God in the present, before you die. The whole, the whole um, emphasis of the covenants with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the giving of the law, emphasize that God wants to reign on earth as it is in heaven. And then when, when His people live under His blessing and do, the, do His things and, and reflect His glory, it will be on earth as it is in heaven. And God takes this Israelite nation and takes them from being a bunch of slaves to pulling them out of slavery into the promised land. Why? So that they can be a signpost of what? God's present 
kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. They're meant to be like a lighthouse to the world and to the nations around so that people will know there's only one God, Yahweh, and the, the other idols are nothing. That's pretty much the message of the entire Old Testament. If you, see, if you look further ahead, you see, um, see the, the, the primary focus of Old Testament spirituality, just to emphasize this again, is a present life of blessing. And such signs of blessings are good, li- good, good health, long life, many children, feasting, abundance, peace, good leadership, all of that, shalom, peace. Even if you look at God's covenant with David, we, we see that God promises him an eternal kingdom. But that's not necessarily the king, one king that will live forever. I see it more as an eternal dynasty, a line of kings that will never be in, uninterrupted. And so in a sense, Judaism was not big on resurrection until about 400 years before Jesus came. And what started to happen is people started to think that maybe this messianic king that was promised, this Messiah that will come and liberate God's people, maybe he will even be so powerful that death will be defeated. And uh, so we see, for example, in Isaiah, um, he talks about a coming kingdom that will be an everlasting kingdom. Isaiah chapter 11, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. All those chapters. We see in um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, famously it says, at that time, so this is at the end of the age, your people will be delivered. Everyone whose name is found and written in the book of life. And here's the verse. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then, in, and then when you start to look back at the Psalms, you see, wow, there were some hints all along from way back about the resurrection. The, one of the best examples are from Psalm 49. It says, uh, Psalm 49 verse 7, it says, Truly, no man can ransom his life, uh, can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice, that he should live on forever and never see the pit. There's the resurrection it says, for he sees that even the, the wise die, the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, the dwelling places to all generations, though they're called lands by their own names. And then it has this big point at the end. It says, man in his pomp, man in his pride will not remain. He's like the beasts that perish. Then it continues. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence, yet after them people approve of their boast. Like sheep, they're appointed for Sheol. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Sheol, the grave. Like sheep, they're appointed for the grave. Death will be their shepherd. And the upright shall rule over them in the morning. It says there's death coming to all of us, but wait for it. There's a new dawn coming for those that are upright. But God will ransom my soul from the power of the grave, for he will receive me, says in the last verse. So there's this clear thought that starts to come, even though the main idea in the Old Testament is that we're called to live under God's blessing now, there's this clear thought, which would have been at the back of this guy's mind, that there's a resurrection to come. There's more to life than what we have. kind of third question that I had as I was thinking around this was what was the criteria? What was he thinking was God going to answer him? How am I going to inherit eternal life? What was the answer he was expecting? And in short, the answer is righteousness. People believe that if you obey the law of Moses, if you are righteous before God, you've done the right thing, you've been a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, you've honored God, you've put him first in everything. If you love God, and love neighbor as yourself, then God is going to look favorably on you in the last day. The second thing, uh, criteria for for eternal life was holiness. That's again the main message of the Old Testament is don't run after other gods. Holiness means you devote yourself completely to serving Jesus and serving Him alone. The third thing, there was diligence and steadfastness. Don't slip up. And the Pharisees, of course, took this to the next level. They said, listen, we are so concerned about reaching eternal life. We're going to make little laws that are going to help us put God first. 
little laws about how far we can walk and what we can do and what we can't do, what we can wash and what we can't wash, all these 600-odd laws. Because they were so desperate, they believed that their radical law-keeping would keep them, would put them in a good place before God. And the thing is, the rich young ruler, this young man, he owned this. This was his game. He says, all of these I have kept until my youth. He says, I've never slipped up. I have kept all these commandments that you mentioned. I have been the model Israelite. I have been, I have been, I've given God my everything. I've consistently chosen the ways of God. That's the criteria for inheriting eternal life. That's the kind of answer that he, he would have been expecting. The fourth kind of question that I asked as I was thinking around this question was, is your inheritance something that you are given or something that you earn? Is your inheritance something that you are given or something that you earn? You see, the father gives an inheritance to his children. There's some proverbs around that also. I'm sure Jason knows them all. He's our proverbs, proverbs expert. Hey, Jace? <laughs> See, a father gives inheritance to his children, yet our daily living as God's children is not divorced from that reality of receiving our inheritance. So we can, for example, lose our inheritance. Esau did it. He gave up his inheritance because he made a foolish decision for a bowl of soup. So we can lose our inheritance, but we cannot earn it through what we do. See, we receive our, our inheritance by virtue of being a child of God in good standing. You don't earn it. It's a subtle difference. Our receiving of our inheritance is the consequence of our actions rather than it's, it's something that causes our inheritance. We'll get back to this. But we don't need to be hard on the young man for being legalistic. I think many times when you read commentaries, you say, ah, he was just being legalistic. He, he, he didn't catch the heart of God. I don't think we can be hard on this young man for being legalistic. I think he was trying his best to position himself in such a way that God's grace, trusting in God's grace, but positioning himself, reorientating his entire life to serving God. It seems to me like he was actually pretty sincere. He was sincere in following God. And that leads to the last question. Why was he asking the question? If he was so spiritual, if he was so full of God, if he had given God his everything, why was he asking this question so desperately of Jesus? Interesting, the book of Mark says he went running up, up to Jesus. It said Jesus was busy here making off. He went running up to Jesus and fell on his knees. He was desperate. Why? I think he sees something in Jesus. He looks in G at Jesus and he sees there is something in this man that is completely on a different playing field to where I'm at. He sees, when he looks at Jesus, he sees that he is falling short, that he's missing the mark. He, seems, he sees something more. He sees something better. He sees something of God inside of Jesus. He sees something of the, of the life of the ages to come, of the blessing of the ages to come when he looks at Jesus. And when he sees that, he realizes, whoa, I'm far off. And he wonders how where he missed the mark. Wonders what, what is missing. And this is where Jesus starts to answer him. And Jesus gives him basically three or four parts to the answer. The first one, he says, why do you call me good? I've always wondered, that's, it's always been a little bit strange to me. It's like it's a strange place to start the question. Start answering the question, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. God alone. You see, this young man saw that Jesus was already living the life of blessing, the life of the ages to come. Jesus wasn't waiting for heaven to die, to die and go to heaven. Jesus was experiencing something of the fullness of God. See, Jesus was living in eternal life already. Jesus was in, some, in a God-like way that he could never be and that he felt he could never be. 
And so Jesus hones in on this concept of goodness. He says, what is good? Where does goodness come from? He says, you are not good at all. Only God is good. See, God is the source of goodness. He's the standard to which we measure goodness. God is the origin of goodness. And Jesus' own goodness only comes through him through his relationship with his Father. Jesus has caught something of the character of God, and that has so transformed him that, it, that when people begin to look at Jesus, they begin to see the Father. Remember, Jesus was a man. He was born as a human being. He was transformed, though, through his relationship with the Father so that when people look at Jesus, they see life of the ages to come. They see good. But that hasn't come. That, that hasn't come through the things that Jesus has done. Instead, Jesus says, no, let me point you to the Father. If you want to know what good is, you're only going to find that out through relationship with your Father. This is eternal life, John chapter 17, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. More than any good work we can do, the priority of Jesus, the priority is a relational unity with the Father. That's where goodness comes from. That's the beginning of eternal life. If you want to read more up about that, this is one of the major themes of the book of John. Major themes of the book of John, where Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in him, and you've got life, a life of the Father. It's a beautiful little dance where he goes around this point in several ways. But that's the first part of the answer. How, must, how would you inherit eternal life? By knowing the Father, and by knowing him deeply in such a way that you are transformed. The second part, this is probably what the guy was expecting to hear. Jesus says, you know the commandments. He says, don't steal, don't do this. And he pretty much implies, do them. You know the commandments, do them. See, this is the standard Jewish answer of the day. If I keep the commandments, God will bless me. If I worship God alone, God will bless me. And the problem is, this guy says, I had done everything. I've done this diligently and steadfastly from my youth. So there's more. And so it says, Jesus looked at him. And he loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. And he says, go, sell all you have and give it to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. And secondly, come and follow me. Two instructions. Yet one thing is missing. What is the one thing? The one thing is that his heart was not surrendered to God. You can be religious, but not be saved. You can be doing all the right things, but still miss the mark. See, the qualification for reaching eternal life, the qualification for inheriting eternal life, is a heart that is completely surrendered to the Father. And connected to the Father. A heart that is not surrendered to God means that we miss out on the life of the ages to come, both in eternity and now in the present age. We live a shadow of the life that we could be. We, we live as weaklings and weak imitations of the fullness of God on every level. We live within the reality of the brokenness of the world, not in the fullness of God. We live as signposts. Yeah, we live as signposts of brokenness rather than signposts of God's love. That's what happens when our heart is not fully surrendered. Like the rich young ruler, unless our heart is fully surrendered to God, he will always look at Jesus, and we will always look at Jesus and think, wow, I am missing the mark. It doesn't matter what you do. And friends, Jesus invites us to eat the bread of life and to drink the river of living water. I mentioned that earlier, John, John chapter 4. Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus says, come, drink, be filled. It's relational. It's about connection with the Father. How do we inherit eternal life? It starts with the Father. And it ends with the Father. It ends with surrender to the will of God. 
And then Jesus starts to talk to the crowds. The man wasn't, he wasn't prepared to surrender. He says he walked away. So Jesus turns to the disciples to try and explain what just happened. He turns to the crowds and he says, basically, he says, how many things here? Four, five things. Number one, wealth is an incredible obstacle to the kingdom of God. He says this twice. Why? It's not the money that's the problem. It's the grip that money has on our heart which is the problem. Money in itself is not bad. But the grip that finances has or the love of money blocking us from surrendering to God, that is the problem. See, it's not a minor problem. It's a major problem. It's like a camel that needs to go through this needle, Jesus says. You see, it's not going to work. Money is a major problem, and, 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 and this thing of an unsurrendered heart. It says the disciples were amazed. It says they were exceedingly astonished. I think he's running out of words to try and describe how they were. Exceedingly is already a big word, and then astonished is also a big word. See, the disciples would have looked at this guy and said, here, here's the primary candidate. If anybody's going to heaven, he is. And Jesus says, you're nowhere. See, friends, this time of debt, this time of spending, this time of income cuts, this time of uncertainty, I want to encourage us to guard our hearts. This is not about money. This is about the heart. Guard your heart and watch your heart that money doesn't become a controlling, it doesn't have control and have a grip on you. One day when we preach around the money series again, the, the first sermon in that series that we, we've done it before is asking the question, does money have you by the throat? For many people, for many different reasons, money has us by the throat. It's like you, if you've watched an action movie recently, you know where they take the guy and kind of hold him by his throat against the wall. We watched Jack Reaper the other day. He does that once or twice. Um, there's the sense where money has us by the throat. And we can't do anything about it. Watch out. Watch out. If that is you, and it's to a lesser and a greater degree, bring that before Jesus and say, Lord, I'm struggling here. Release me from this burden. The second thing Jesus says to the crowd, he says, but with God, all things are possible. See, this obstacle can be removed by God. You can inherit eternal life even as a rich man, but it requires a releasing, a relinquishment, an abandonment of the riches of this world so that you can embrace the riches of God. You cannot have it both. See, the impossibility lies not in the money and that it's hard to give away the money. That wasn't the challenge. I'm sure that rich man would have given money away before. The impossibility is that the heart of a man is stubborn. That is the impossibility here. That a heart of a man is stubborn and, and, and struggles to trust in God. It's amazing the claim of Jesus here. He says that it's God himself who is able to help us let go and trust him. The blockage here, the reason why the camel cannot go through the needles because of the condition of the heart. And Jesus says, with God it's possible. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, we are saved by and through grace. And this grace is a gift of God. It says, the Father himself who is the origin of our, he's, he's the answer. He's the reason. He can supernaturally stretch the eye of the needle so that this camel can pass through. That's what God does when he saves us. He takes the impossible. He takes our hearts, which are hard, and he bends them and he pulls them apart so that the Holy Spirit can come in and change us from the inside. See, but for the grace of God, we are nowhere. We have no hope. But for the grace of God, but with God, all things are possible. The third thing that Jesus says, he says, the promise of eternal life to those that surrender and follow Jesus is sure. Again, he says this twice, verse 29 to 23. He says, there's no one 
that has surrendered house or brothers and fathers and lands and all of that, there's no one who has surrendered who will not receive both in the eternal age and in the present age blessings. Goth is a financial, inv- a, a, a financial broker. If, you, if I go and give him money to invest, he's going to say these are expected return on investments. But a good broker will always say <laughs> past, performance does not guarantee, uh, past performance does not guarantee future rewards. If these assets performed at a 10%, it's not guaranteed that in the next five years they will get 10%. They can have their projections and do whatever they can. Jesus says this is a guaranteed investment. He says there's no one that has left fathers and houses and mothers for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel who will not also inherit in this age and in the age to come. For me, the answer links back to this question of inheriting. Do we earn our inheritance or do we receive our inheritance? And I said... Inheritance is the consequence of what we've done. We receive it, but it comes as the consequence of our action of surrendering our hearts to Jesus. I had a sense. No stress. I had a sense in the week that God's calling us to get our house in order. God's calling us to take stock of where we're at and do the necessary to get our house in order. If you want to live a life of blessing, get your house in order. What is it that is standing between you and God? What is it that is an obstacle? What is it that is a struggle? What is it that is a hurt in your life? And what are you going to do about that? I washed my car last week. I do it about twice a year. But I was, <laughs> I was so irritated for such a long time now that my car was like really filthy inside and outside, and it was bad. And you know, like, you can get irritated, and then you just actually need to take three hours, because it takes them three hours if it's that dirty, to properly vacuum and clean it properly, inside, outside. I can't expect to to feel the satisfaction (laughs) unless I actually just get it, get the job done. Yeah, more often. (laughs) Of course, then it rains the same day that you wash your car. Who's who's had that? Come on, let's be honest here. I wash my car twice a year and it always rains the same day. But I sense sense God saying, get your house in order. Stop making excuses for your filthy car. Stop making excuses. This This is the thing that you can do. You can't save yourself. But, you, but there are some, some things that you know what God has put in front of you. The fourth thing Jesus says to the crowd is he says that inheritance is one of incredible blessing. See, again, you give up family, you give up lands, you give up things, you give up jobs, you give up opportunities, and you get a hundredfold back. So imagine you give up one house, you get a hundred houses. Which one are you going to choose? Ah, it's painful to leave my house. But there's a hundred coming. Which one are you going to choose? Incredible riches. It feels to me as if Jesus is saying, listen, here is immeasurable blessing, immeasurable joy. Here's a small measurable loss. Which one do you want? Which one are you going to choose? And for me, the, the, one of the most amazing phrases in this passage is three words. It says, in this life. He says, you give up houses and things. You put God first. You surrender now. The blessing comes not only when you die. In this life, hundredfold. Hundredfold. See, the gospel is not only that we will go to heaven when we die. The gospel is not only that we're going to be with Jesus in a resurrected body one day. The gospel is that Jesus invites us now in this body, in this broken world, to live on earth as it is in heaven. Hundredfold. Hundredfold. The gospel is that God gives us this choice which seems like it's too good to be true. And you know what the sad reality is? So many people choose death. So many people choose death. 
That's why we've had a hard week. We've been in conversation with some people this week. When you work in church, for the church and in the church context, you're, you're in conversation with people who choose death over life. And it's painful. It's painful. People refuse to, to deal with their brokenness. People refuse to let go of their idols. People refuse to deal with the things that stand between them and God. That's too painful. People hold on to cigarettes and alcohol and addictions. People hold on to, 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 to wrong kind of sexual relationships. People hold on to brokenness of every kind. People choose death. People hold on to the pain. People hold on to the hurt. Christianity is not about making a decision to give your life to Jesus. It's about following Him every day. Saying, Lord, here's my heart. I surrender it again today. I did it yesterday. And I might need to do it tomorrow. But for this day, Lord, you would you be my daily bread? That is Christianity. A journey of following Jesus every single day. The last word here is around is, is another surprise phrase. It says, with persecutions. You inherit a hundredfold. And it says, with persecutions. Maybe we weren't expecting that. But we're probably also not expecting it in Romans chapter 18, when he talks about inheritance. And he says, we will become fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, so that we may be glorified with Him. See, Jesus is, not say, is saying that we should expect He's saying we should expect to see persecution in our lives. That is a part and parcel of the hundredfold blessing on earth as it is in heaven. It's not saying persecution comes from God. It says expect it. And it says, it's like saying if you're on the front line of the battle, you should expect to see some bullets fly your way. Because we're called to be in the front line of God's battle. Bringing light where there's darkness. If you're on the front line, you should expect to see, to see bullets and maybe some will even hit you. Expect to see persecutions. See, if you are living the good life, if you are a thriving or a maturing Jesus follower, but there are no signs of persecution in your life, maybe you are not in the front line. Maybe there's a problem. See, the inheritance of God's kingdom, of the life of the ages to come, is this huge, incredible blessing, but also some pain along the way. If you're not experiencing both realities, and think about your life, even right now, think of your last week, think of your last month. What bullets have come your way because of your relationship with Jesus? It's quite a sobering thought for some of us that have been Christians for a while. When last did you stand up for injustice and had the rest of the people who don't care about the injustice fly at you? <laughs> When last did you stand up for somebody? When last did you speak out when everybody else was gossiping? When last did you swim against the grain? When last did you feel the hurt of rejection as you prayed for somebody for healing and they rejected you? When last were, were, did we feel that? Because when we're on the front line, the bullets come. And friends, God calls us to be on the front line. We're not called to be comfortable. This is not a social club. We are, we are serious about following Jesus, serious about putting Jesus first and taking his kingdom to the ends of the world. For me, the story is in one word about surrender. In one word. How do you do that? For me, you make, there's two things. We make a covenant with God. We say, Lord, Today I give you my heart. Simple prayer. Lord, I give you my heart. I live for you alone. It's a covenant. It's a moment. It, we can do it now, and certainly we can pray afterwards. But the second thing is, it's a lifelong habit of surrendering. It's a lifelong journey of surrendering, of allowing yourself to be formed. And Jesus invites this man to do both. Here's the moment. Go sell all you have. And here's the covenant. Come and follow me. 
a moment and it's a journey. And can I invite you? Let's get radical about these relationships, home groups, grief share, men's groups, women's groups, Bible studies, whatever it is. Go and walk at the beachfront with some friends where we are intentional about discipleship because that is the place where we are, where we are being formed. That's this part of following Jesus. This is not about just a moment. It's about that journey of following Jesus. Let's be intentional around that, even in the holiday times. Ask God, what are those conversations? What are those moments? Where am I going to be your light this holidays? Let's put Jesus first. Even for those that are online, I'm not sure which camera to look at here. If you guys are online, are you watching online because it's comfortable? I know we've got a pandemic and we've got another wave coming, but we need to continue to ask ourselves, how do I get into the front line of what God is doing? Let's not sit in the wings. I feel like the time for sitting in the wings is over. It's time to get on stage. It's time to play our part. It's time to do our thing. It's time to join the front line of the battle. Amen? Amen.